Anyway, now that we have nailed down our domain model, our database, um, then we go ahead and create our project. Okay? So at this point, let me see what project. So, this is what you guys should do to create your project. Right click on it, create a new project. What type of project is it going to be? It's going to be a dynamic web project. I'm going to call it Timex Web. Now, I suggest you guys give it a, 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 a nickname or something to your project, like some of you call it uh, ECPC, other other, um, other guys call it inventory, other another guy called his um, ultimate. You know, give it a some kind of nickname that you that identifies your project. Doesn't have doesn't have to be the whole title of the project. Okay. Make sure that the target runtime is Tomcat 6.0. I have noticed some of you are using Tomcat 7.0. Please don't. Okay. Try to stay with the same runtime environment that we're developing in class. If you run into problems, or worse yet, I run into problems running your project, it's not going to be my fault. It's going to be your fault. I warn you. Apache Tomcat version 6.0. Nothing else. Okay? And then, you know, the SRC, it's going to be the folder by default. The output folder is going to be build classes. That's fine. The context root, try to keep it the same name as the, um, of the project. Timex Web is fine. And the content directory, I, th I noticed that some of you change it. That's okay. I like it to keep it simple, so web content is fine. So pretty much at this point, you know, I just kept all the defaults. And here it is. I have Timex Web, at least the the empty shell of it. Okay. Um, First thing that I will do is I will go into the web XML and wipe out absolutely everything that has to do with HTML and defaults. Just keep index.jsp. Index.jsp is going to be your home page. Okay? And then start building your models. To do that, you need to create a new package under source. What's going to be the name of the package? It's going to be commercial, it's going to be Timex Web, it's going to be domain. That's where the domain, the model classes are going to live. Okay? So once you create that, package, then you create your model classes. And this this is something that was due today. And you could have done this many different ways. I'm going to show you just one of them. You Yes. Question. This is the project that you guys were supposed to create for today. Yes. This is a file that, I, this is how I'm creating my project, Timex, showing you how I create it, and I'm going to post, I'm going to upload it to um, Moodle tonight, and you guys can download it and play with it. Yeah, just pay attention to what I'm doing, okay? I'm trying to catch up with what you guys were supposed to do for tonight. And then... Um, so I create a new class. And this is one of the many ways that you could have done it. So I'm going to create a class under the Timex Web domain. Anytime now. What's going to be the name of the class? Let's start with the simplest of them all. Department. 
doesn't get more simple than that. Department. Okay? What's going to be the super class? Object. Department is going to be a Java bean. What does that mean? It doesn't inherit from any other class. It's a plain old Java object. So like every class in Java, it inherits from object. Okay? Do we need a public static void main? Typically, if you add a main, it's because you want to be able to run this class on its own. No, we do not want. We want to keep our domain classes as clean and lean as possible. That means that we only want the classes and their attributes. That's it. And obviously, their getters and setters. Department. That's it. Finish. We got our first domain class. We're going to need a name for this guy. String department name. And what else? We're string department code. They don't have to match the same names as the fields and the tables. But, but if you tr if you name them the same name as the fields and the tables, you're gonna try to make your life easier. Later on, and we're gonna see that tonight, when we create the mappings, the object relational map m mappings between the tables and the classes, we're gonna see that if you have named them the same, you gotta do less work on mapping. And then at this point, what do you do? You just let Eclipse do the rest of the work. You go to right-click on the class, go to Source, say Generate Getters and Setters, and you generate it for Department Code and Department Name, and there you go. Okay? Now, notice one thing. Notice that if you have a string, a number, pretty much all the um, all the main types in in uh, in Java, the getters and setters are going to generate a get, G E T. Then the name of the variable with the first letter capitalized. That's how you get that's how you get the get department capital D name capital N. Okay? And the equivalent setter will be S E T department capital D name capital N. Okay? That's the convention. Now if you have and this is the only exception. If you have a boolean, let's say that we have a boolean in the department saying whether it's an active department or not, just for giggles, right? And this is typical of change of requirements. Hey, we build our model, our system with a department code and department name. Somebody down the road while we're developing the project said, you know what? We need to identify if the department is an active department or not, or whatever. This is what you will do. You will come back to your model and add that Boolean call active. And yes, you have to create the getters and setter for it. So when you tell Eclipse to create the getter and setter for active, Notice that the convention changed a little. It's no longer get active and set active. Because we're talking about a Boolean, which has a true or false value. So it changes to is active and set active. And that's okay. 
because that's the Java convention. So the getter, what we typically know as the getter, is going to be called is active. And the other one is going to be the setter, the set active. Okay? And then you will do it in a similar way. You will do the same thing with timesheet and employee. You will add each one of the classes and you will add each one of the attributes. Since you already know that, I'm just going to do it in fast forward. Okay, so here they are. This is my department, this is my employee, and the employee, notice that the employee, and this is something that we didn't really need to do it, implements from Serializable. Serializable is one of the Java interfaces that all it does is marks a class whether it can be persisted or not. If you say that implements serializable and you need to be able to persist whatever is in memory, it will do that. And it will do that only for the classes that inherit that implement from ser serializable from the interface serializable. Okay? Uh but you don't really need to do that. <coughs> what else do we have in here? Well, we have all the attributes. This is all the attributes for um, the employee. Notice that we have an employee ID. We have a manager employee ID. Ha! Huh. I forgot that in my model. If you guys remember, one of the requirements was that I submit a timesheet. And when I submit it, my boss is going to be notified about it. Well, my boss, guess what? He's also an employee. So somehow i got to be able to implement the hierarchical structure of the company within the employee table. And this is how you do it. You basically add a field called the manager employee ID, which will hold the ID of my boss. In my record, manager employee ID is going to be the ID of my boss. I also have a name, a password, an email address. I forgot about that. An employee code. Employee code, in this case, is almost like the role or the title or something like that. And this is something that I want you guys to keep track of your of any one of your entities that you want to be able to um, have, in fact, it's of your users that are going to have different access to different things in your website based on their role. In this case, the role is called the employee code. Okay? And then notice that I can have a list of timesheets a list of timesheets and I'm going to be calling it the weeks worked. Okay? Initially you don't really need to do that. We'll see later on why it's so important to do it. But initially if you just stick with the plain attributes that we were talking about in the model, you should be okay. Okay? Now, what, uh, what else have we added in this employee class? Well, the employee code really determines the role of the employee. And we want to be able to assign, remember, when we look at the database, 
Let me just take a look at the database quickly because I skipped that part. But it's a good idea to come back to it. Yep, I don't have my SQL up and running. So let me run my SQL quickly. Now I have it up and running. And notice the Timex database, which you guys are going to... I'm going to provide the SQL file for the Timex database as well as part of the project. And I hope you do so also. From here on, any version of the project that you turn in, that you submit, must have a SQL file inside with the latest backup of your database. So this Timex, if you look at it, <coughs> the employee has an employee code. And we have decided that the employees are either hourly employees, H, managers, M, E executives or A accountant. Those are the roles, the different kind of users in the Timex system. And you will have something similar. You will have a similar uh, hierarchy key or or a hier not hierarchy but a, a similar um, role assignment of the, your different users. So we got to put that inside the class. We got to be able to define what are the different employee codes. So we have created static finals. Those are constants in Java, remember? Final static are constants. And these are going to be the hourly constant, which is H, the manager constant, which is M, the executive constant E, and accounting, which is A. So those are the possible values and they're going to be coming from the employee class. We also no get it, we're going to provide a get type function. And get type all it's going to do it's going to return staff if the employee code is H, management if it's M, executive if it's E, and accounting if it's A. Just to give us the type of employee. Okay? And then the rest of the stuff you already know. These are the getters and setters of the attributes. And we're done with our employee. Now let's take a look at our timesheet. Timesheet is probably the most uh, complicated one. Let's go through these. Here it is. I have my timesheet ID. First of all, let's take a look at it in the database. Just to give you a a reminder what it looks like. Timesheet ID, the employee ID that it belongs to, the status of the timesheet, the period ending date, you know, the department code where it's being charged, and then all the minutes for Monday, Tuesday, all through Sunday, and that's about it. Okay? So how do we put that in Java? Here it is. Timesheet ID, employee ID, Minutes for Monday, Tuesday, they're all initialized in zeros. Notice that we are not even saving hours now. I know we're trying to keep track of hours, but there's a possibility that the employees could have worked a fraction of an hour. And we don't want to have to manipulate fractions of an hour. So the best way to do that is to actually save minutes worked. So. 360 minutes would be 6 hours, right? And 390 minutes would be 6.5 hours. Much better than creating uh, decimals and then try to manipulate decimals. So we're going to save here the minutes. Then the status code, the department code that it belongs to, the period ending date, that's going to be a date. Somebody asked me, are we going to have all the fields being strings? My answer was, not a good idea. If you set up a 
feel that you know it's going to be a date, whether it's a date of birth or some kind of deadline or whatever, a date. And you try to save that date as a string, you're going to have a lot of problems trying to manipulate that date if you declare as a string. In fact, any of you guys have downloaded the healthcare system that I published last week? Did you take a look? You couldn't make it work? Okay, I, I can go through it if we have enough time uh, by the end of tonight. But the idea is for you guys to download it and run it and actually appreciate. Even if it's just download and debug it, you know, step by step, you will see all the hoops and loops that you have to go through just to do like something as simple as converting a date because it's being saved as a date then you have to do a whole bunch of date manipulations and and um, um, it's just a lot of work and the, all that work is put inside the healthcare system code and it's work that you don't have to do when you add a framework like Hibernate but we'll get to see that in one hour or so. All right, so the pure ending date, then the department. Notice that the department, look at this. This is pretty cool because this actually gives you, <coughs> excuse me, gives you the actual implementation. It gives you the actual implementation of your model. This is the model. Remember? And we said that a timesheet is being managed by one employee. And then the timesheet is charged the time sheet time is charged by one department. Look at this. Right here in Java, this is where we're establishing that relationship. Notice that inside the timesheet class, we have a department variable and an employee variable. Okay? Of ty obviously, of type department, which we already declared as one of the classes, domain classes. And also the employee type, which is also another one of our domain classes. And they belong to the timesheet. It's, it's said right here. We, we did it in the model. We said timesheet is being managed by one employee and timesheet is being charged by one department. So you include those as attributes of your timesheet, even though they're separate entities, department and employee. Why would you do something like that? You have any idea why you would do something like that? Include as attributes of timesheet include an employee and include a department? What happens when you finally populate all these fields with a timesheet information? Like this timesheet is number one. Okay? Timesheet number one is for employee ID two. The status is spending. The period in the day is, to th is August 19, 2006. The department code is IT. And all that stuff, all these eight hours for Monday, eight hours for Tuesday, all that stuff is being populated. Okay? You want to know, you want to know what employee this time she belongs to? If you keep it this way, the only thing you know is that it's employee ID 2. Mm. Who is employee ID 2? Who knows? But having the employee
employee variable inside the timesheet gives you the ability to address all the different attributes that the employee has from within the timesheet. So you could say something like timesheet.employee.name and now you know whose timesheet is. Or employee.email and you can send an email to this guy all through the timesheet. Or employee.employee code and you know if he or she is an hourly manager, etc., etc., etc. So you get the point. Same thing with the department. You will be able to know the depart not only the department code, but you also be able you be able to know the department name through the department variable of the timesheet. And this is all going to be managed automatically by Hibernate. Okay. Now we're going to provide a few uh, functions that are going to make our life easier with timesheets. For instance, one of the functions is going to be get the total minutes. You want to be able to add up all the minutes worked during the week, and just by saying, "I know I don't have a property called total minutes." but I can have a function called, hey, get total minutes. And all it does is it adds up the minutes for Monday, the minutes for Tuesday, the minutes for Wednesday, etc. And it gives me a total. And it will give me the total of minutes worked for that timesheet, period. Also, a good idea is to have a function something like is approved. What would is approved mean in a timesheet? that the status code of the timesheet is A. How can you put that in code? Look at this. That the status code is equal, ignoring the case. That's one of the string functions that you guys have to be familiar with because it's very powerful. That the status code equals, ignoring the case, to approved. And approved, if you recall, no, you don't recall because I haven't mentioned it yet. Um, it's one of the constants that you have to declare in in the timesheet. Sort of the same way that you did it with for the employee, which H means hourly, M means management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In a similar way, S means submitted, P means pending, A means approved, and these are all static finals, constants. Okay, that you declare inside the timesheet. This just makes things easier for you. Is that the only way? To, no. You could have just, in say, instead of saying approved here, you could have just replaced it with double quote A, double quote. But this is more readable. Is approved means that the status code is equal to approved. I can read it right there. And that's a business rule. Implement it. As simple as that. What does is pending mean? And look at this. Is pending means that the status, the status code of the timesheet is equal to pending or to disapproved. That's how we know that the Timesheet is pending. Leave it as a JPEG or PNG or whatever you want it, and then you upload it to your wiki. Okay? And also, so your problem statement, functional requirements, domain model, UI sketches, and also the storyboard. And the storyboard is going to be, this is version 1. It's going to be an image of from the signing of your project, depending on who is signing, what are the different things that you're going to get.
or what are the different pages that you're going to go to depending on who you are. So if you are an employee, after signing, the first thing you get is a timesheet list. If you're a manager, you get a staff report. If you're an executive, you get an overall summary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for next week, I need you to give it a, a first shot at your storyboard. And also, at this point, you should already know who is your main entity or the most important entity of your, of your project. I need you to provide to me an, a diagram like this one. It's called a finite state machine of the different statuses of your main entity. What's the main entity in the Timex? It's going to be timesheet. We already know that. So this is a finite state machine of all the different statuses for timesheet. So from pending goes to submitted. From submitted, it could either go to approved or disapproved. If it's being disapproved, the only way it can go back is being submitted. Yes? Correct. The U.S. schedules do not have to be working, obviously. Otherwise, you will already be done with the project. <laughs> They're just mock-ups of what the different pages are going to look like. Okay? So right here, by looking at this diagram, you can actually realize that, yes, if a timesheet is pending, it's because either it's being submitted. I'm sorry, what was the question? Going back to the code. It's pending, it's, e it's e either because the status is pending, it has not been submitted, or it was submitted, but it got disapproved. Okay? So pending means it's either in this category P or in this category D because it has not been approved. Well, once you save it and it's still pending, you can submit it as, pen as uh, submitted. It's the same. It's the same kind of logic. When you submit it and it gets disapproved. What's the next thing that you can do? Submit it again. You know that it's being disapproved because the status code will be D. Correct. But from the business perspective, and this is something that I want you to be to differentiate between the actual code and the business perspective of the code. Yes, from the code you're right, the status code for disapprove is D and the status code for pending is P. But from the business perspective, which is what we're trying to put inside this timesheet class, P or D is a pending timesheet. And that's why in here is pending function implements it this way. It's either or the status code is pending or disapproved. Okay. And then you get your typical getters and setters, as you can see. Getters and setters, getters and setters of all the different attributes. And we're done. Good. So what's next now? First of all, we want to we want our project to be able to communicate with a MySQL database. And the first class I show you guys that to be able to do that, I think I did it here in first JSP. Let's open the project. First JSP, what I did was under the web content, under the web inf, under the library. I added the MySQL connector, which is a jar containing the classes that will allow me to connect to a MySQL database. So I suggest you copy that jar inside the library folder of your project. That takes care of making sure that your project knows 
how to communicate with a database. Okay? The MySQL Connector Java 504 bin. Now, where would you find that? You will find it under the... If you guys downloaded the, the author source code that I adapted to MySQL, it's also in my healthcare system probably. But if you downloaded the source code from the author, that source code contains, when you unzip it, you, it contains one of the folders that it contains its library. In it, you will find all the jars that we're going to need. All the jars that we're going to need to build the project. When I say all the jars, I mean the spring framework, the J unit framework, the hibernate framework, the different connectors for the different databases, etc. etc. So you know what? We're gonna make our things e a lot easier if we just take the entire contents of that library folder. Okay? And copy it and put it inside the library folder of the project. I know initially it might be an overkill because initially we're not requiring all those jars but that's going to take care of all our dependencies for now in fact for now and for the rest of the semester okay so just by copying all the jars from the library folder inside your project that's going to make sure that your project has all the de necessary dependencies. <coughs> Notice that that includes Hibernate, which is the, the, the one library that we're going to be using tonight, and JUnit, that's another library that we're going to be using tonight. Any questions? Explore. If you are in the Project Explorer, you cannot open any one of those jars. But if you are in the Package Explorer, you can actually go into Web App Libraries and open any of those jars. And it will show you not only the different packages that it contains, but also the different classes that each package contains. Now, they are not the source code, which is why they show up as dot .class. So when you try open it, it will look like this. It's an ugly... It won't show you the source code. But there is a way of looking at the source code. Okay. Alright. So now that we have done that, and we have all the necessary dependencies. What do we have at this point? We have an Eclipse project with all our model classes. We have a MySQL database that reflects those model classes. So now what we have to do is we have to bring Hibernate into our project and start working with Hibernate so that it maps those tables in the database to my model classes. <coughs> to do that, we're going to have to add the Hibernate library, which we already have. It's right here, Hibernate 3. See that? Hibernate 3 jar is going to be the jar necessary to to um, bring Hibernate, the fr Hibernate framework working for us. <coughs> what else do we need to do?
What else do we need to do? Well, let's bring Hibernate. How do we bring Hibernate to our project? Well, Hibernate uses a configuration file. It's going to be an XML file. Okay? And what I want you guys to do is just copy it out of the source code that I share with you and put it under your source folder. The name is going to be hibernate.cfg, which stands for configuration.xml. Yeah, in the source code you will find that file. Yes, copy it. Copy it into the SRC folder of your project. And let's open it up. Let's see what it has. Notice that it's an XML file that will indicate to hibernate the framework what kind of database we're going to be using. In fact, not only what kind of database, but it will also give the hibernate the credentials to connect to the database, the name of the database, the protocol that it's going to be using, the port that we're going to be using, the dialect that we're going to be using, everything, all the different configuration, the database configuration for the project to work and communicate with the database. So we're going to see that Hibernate configuration is made out of a huge session factory. And it's called a session factory because it, from here Hibernate will create all the different sessions for our web server. Okay. What are the different properties of the session factory? Well, we're going to see that one of them, for instance, is the connection, the driver class connection. What is it going to be? MySQL JDBC driver. And yes, if you guys remember, com that mysql that jdbc that driver was one of the classes that were part of the co of the mysql connector in fact where have we seen that class before any of you guys remember where have we seen that class before aha uh -huh. you guys remember the first jsp that we created that first jsp contain Java code inside the HTML and that Java code was declaring a string variable called driver and what was it? It was com mysql jdbc driver. Okay? That is going to be part of the Hibernate configuration and it's going to be different than the way it was done in first JSP project in the sense that it's, not, it's no longer going to be part of the JSP. In fact, it's going to be no longer part of the code, the Java code. It's going to be in the XML, external from the Java code. Okay? So that's, that, that, that's one of the main characteristics that you're going to see when you use frameworks that all the configuration is going to be external from the source code. Why is it a good idea to have all the configuration stuff external from the source code? So you don't have to change the source code when your configuration changes. <laughs> all you have to do is change the XML. You don't want to you don't want to have to change the source code. The least you change the source codes, the better. The more dynamic, the more configurable your software will be. Okay? So, what else do we have? We have the connection URL property. And the connection URL is going to be JDBC MySQL, it's going to be localhost because we're going to be running in localhost through port 3306. This is the port that MySQL listens to by default. And what's going to be the name of the database? Timex. What else do we have? We have the connection username. What's going to be the connection username? And I hope everybody uses the same, please. Root. And what's going to be the password? Empty. Please do not put anything else in there. If you put a different username or a different password than root and empty, then I'm not going to be able to create your stuff. 
What else do we have here? We also have a pool size connection. Look at this. A pool size. So we're going to have two connections. Concurrent connections to the database. And this can be changed depending on whether you are testing it on your development environment or testing it on a QA server or testing it on the real production server. You can adjust the pool size of your connections. In development, in development, it's a good idea to keep it low. Two is fine. In QA, bump it up a little. In production, bump it up a lot. Hopefully in production, your server will have much more memory, so it will handle, it will be capable of handling a much bigger pool size of connections. Also, notice one of the properties show SQL. Yes, if you are under development, you want to see the SQL statement that Hibernate is creating for you. So you can look at it and try to debug it. Would it be a good idea in QA and production to do that? Not. So probably in production show SQL, you will set it to false. You don't want to see the SQL statements generated. And in fact, that's going to give that's going to give extra work to your server and it's going to make it slower. Work slower. So in production, that will be false. What's going to be the dialect used by Hibernate? Well, since we're connecting to a MySQL database, the dialect is going to be a MySQL dialect. Is that the only dialect the Hibernate knows? No. In fact, you will see that this is probably one of the oldest versions of Hibernate because of the jar that was uh, shared by the author. But you will see that today's Hibernate is capable of communicating with almost every relational database management system out there. I mean, I'm talking about Oracle, Informix, DB2, um, almost every single database out there. Okay? But in this case, we want the MySQL dialect. What else do we have? We want current session context to be thread safe. Okay? And we also want the cache provider, no cache. So initially, in development, we don't want any cache. Okay? In other words, we don't want anything that it's, that it's going to hold in memory just because there was a query that brought me that information and it's holding in memory the next time that somebody asks for the same query if it's cached it's going to use that uh, data but in this case in my testing environment I don't want any cache every time that I ask for that query I want you to go to the database and bring it to me because I want to make sure that the data is clean Okay, doesn't matter if it takes extra step to go to the database and bring it. Now, in production or in QA, yes, it makes sense to have it cached. You don't want to uh, make your database server work harder than when it has to. And then finally, finally, the mappings. And the mappings are going to be the ones that Hibernate will keep track of. In fact, there's going to be one mapping for every single table in the database. So we're going to have a department hibernate mapping XML, a timesheet hibernate mapping XML, and an employee hibernate mapping XML. Where do we have those? We have those in the same folder as the com hibernate configuration. So we're going to bring them over. and we're going to put them under our SRC and let's take a look at the simplest them of all the department hibernate mapping this is a hibernate mapping oh by the way when we put mapping and the resource is an external XML it's going to look for that XML in the same folder where the configuration is if you're going to house it in a different folder then you have to create a relative path from it Okay, so
So mapping is almost like an include of that XML. And what do we have for the department hibernate mapping? Well, this is going to be an XML that is going to declare a class. What's the name of the class? The name of the class is going to be com Timex Web Domain Department. It has to be a fully qualified class name. This is what a fully qualified class means. You have to specify the full package and class name. Then you specify the table that is going to be associated with. What's in the table? Department. Let me see. Oh, so it's not case sensitive. You guys notice that? So, department lowercase d in MySQL database can be table department uppercase d. Good. Now, this class, or this table, I should say, has an ID. An ID is a reserved word for primary key. So when you say primary key in the table, it's the same thing as saying ID in the hibernate mapping. What's going to be the primary key? The name is going to be department code. Ah, wait a minute. The name where? In the class or in the table? In this case, you're specifying it in the class. So if you go to the department, and this is what I'm doing right now, I'm hitting Control key, and then clicking on the fully qualified name of the class, and it will take me there. Notice that department code is the name of the field. This is the name that it's referring to, the name of the field. And the associated column in the department table is going to be department code. Right here. Where are you? Department code. So, to answer, I don't know whose question was it, whether we need to have the same name or not. The answer is no. They don't need to have the same name, but it makes easier. It makes it e easier for you if, if if you specify the same names. Not so much in the IDs, but in the in the properties, and we'll see that later on. Um, so if you specify a different name in the class, you will change this name. Now this is a primary key in here, okay? But it's not automatically generated. It's not a primary key automatically generated by the database. Okay? So the generator is going to be assigned, which means whenever we create a new department, whenever we create a new department, we're going to assign that key. It's not automatically done by the database. And then there's another property of the department called the name which mass matches the column name. Very well. Let's take a look at the hibernate mapping. Hibernate mapping for employee, this is the fully qualified name of the class. This is the name of the table. Notice the ID is employee ID and the column is employee ID. The generator is also a sign. Okay? So, in other words, the database is not going to the database is not going to generate this employee ID. Okay? I'm going to assign it. That makes give me the freedom that maybe the employee ID is the social security number or some bigger number that we have out there in human resources or whatever. You know, an N number. Then all the other different properties name, password, email. Notice one thing. I did not specify a column in here. That means that, hey, both name and column will be called the same. Okay? So, that's something very important to keep track of. In fact, I could have done the same thing here. because name is the name 
of the attribute inside the department and is also the column name inside department table. Okay? Now, what I suggest you guys do, and I have seen students from previous semesters struggling a lot with this, try to keep your names simple. Try to avoid funny characters, underscore, dashes, uh, blah, 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 whatever. Try to make it as simple as possible. Remember, Hibernate is trying to match the names in the fields with the names in the table. If you make it harder for Hibernate to do the mapping, it's going to make it harder for you to debug your project when you run into problems. Okay, so same kind of deal here with employee. Employee has a name, a password, an email. Employee has a name, a password, an email. So in the hibernate mapping, I do not have to specify the t the the um, the column. Got it? And then finally, timesheet. Here's timesheet. This is the class. This is the table. Ha! Ah, look at the ID, the primary key. Timesheet ID, timesheet ID. Generator identity. This is telling Hibernate the database is in charge of assigning that primary key. In fact, it will be. How do I know that? Well, when you guys create it, and if, if the database that you guys submitted tonight do, does not have these characteristics, I hope for next week you guys go back and modify those characteristics. In department, when I edit the table, notice that department code, it's not a primary key. I know it's going to be my primary key, but I didn't specify in the database as a primary key. In employee, employee ID is not a primary key. What happens when I declare the field a primary key in the ta in the in the database? It's going to try to auto increment. Okay, and I don't want that except for timesheet. In timesheet. Yes, I do want the database to manage the primary key, auto-increment. Okay? wonder if I can do this. I could probably declare it as a primary key, not auto increment. Yeah, I can do that. So as long as it's not auto increment, which I don't want the department code and the employee ID to be auto increment, but when I create a brand new timesheet, I don't want to have to keep track of what was the last timesheet ID that I created? No, I want the database to manage that. That's why. I make it a primary key auto increment and in the mapping I declare the genera generator to be identity not assigned okay and then the rest of the stuff is almost the same employee ID status code look at the peer ending date we had to specify date as the type what is the hibernate property type by default string notice that we never had to say anything about a type when it was a string name employee code all that stuff was strings but the minute we change the default type of a property you have to indicate so 
In this case, period ending date, the type is a date. Okay. Then the minutes Monday. It's a not null value. We have to have a value in any one of these, even if it's a zero. So that's what not null false means. And then here is the most important piece of the hibernating mapping. In fact, this is the piece that is going to allow us to create a timesheet from the table data and all its associated employee and department data. Remember? Remember we had a department and an employee attributes inside timesheet? Here's we where we will declare the relationships. There is a many-to-one relationship between the department and the timesheet. Okay? And this is how you should read the many-to-one relationship. To the department name. And this refers to the attribute inside timesheet that will have that relationship. So if you go into the timesheet class, notice that there is a department field. Or I should say variable, attribute, whatever you want to call it. A department variable of type department. That's the one that we're referring to in here. I'm sorry, here. Okay? And how do we know what column in the table to associate it to? Well, the column is going to be the T department code. And if you guys take a look at the timesheet, Where is it? The middle one. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so it's this T department code, right? That's going to be the column name that is going to give us the relationship between the timesheet and the department. Now, we know that the class is going to be this class, right? And then we're going to specify a whole bunch of attributes that will tell us how Hibernate is going to pull that data, the department data, inside the timesheet. First of all, it's not going to be lazy. What does that mean? Lazy false. That means that if I retrieve a timesheet, I don't want you to be lazy about retrieving the associated department for that timesheet. I want you to retrieve it at the same time as the timesheet data. If you specify lazy true, you could probably load timesheet data in an object, in a Java object, without the associated department information. But once you refer to that data in the department object, then it will automatically retrieve it out of the database. That's in the lazy true fashion. Okay? But in this case, we want the Hibernate framework to not be lazy about it. So it's going to retrieve, at the same time as it retrieves the, the timesheet data, it will retrieve the department associated to it. If it's not found, just ignore it. We don't want to create an exception. We don't want to. Do we want to cascade? Suppose that we delete. If we delete the timesheet, do we want to cascade down to. In fact, the cascade is, it refers to the department. So if we delete a department in our table, do we want all the timesheets associated to that department to cascade? In other words, will they be deleted? And the answer is no. We don't want to cascade. And then we don't want to do an insert or an update on those 
through the timesheet. So that means that if somebody changes the department information inside a timesheet, it will not get updated in the database. Okay? Why would you do something like that? Why would you why wouldn't you want to update the department information if it's done through the timesheet? Probably from the business perspective, it doesn't make sense that you change the department information from the timesheet point of view. If you want to change the department information, go ahead and do it within the department, but not through the timesheet that you want to associate it with. Okay? In a similar fashion, there's a many-to-one relationship between the employee and the timesheet. So, in the employee, that's the name of the attribute inside the class. This is employee ID is the column associated to it. And here it is, the domain model. In fact, you know what? This is not going to work. I know it's not called T department code. I know that for a fact. I know that for a fact, so this is not going to work. It's not going to be T department code. It's going to be department code. This refers to the to the column name, as well as here. It, it refers to the column name inside timesheet. Yes, you're right. And also the regular name. Yeah, because as you can see, the department code here refers to the one in the timesheet. What is it called in the timesheet? Oh, you're right. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Sorry about that. So it is called. Yeah, but it's not called like that in the column. That's what I'm saying. So up to that point, it's fine. 